Hi, my name is Doug Fields from Download Youth Ministry, and I'm honored to share with you some, some thoughts about how to better connect with teenagers in your ministry. See, one of my life passions is to help youth workers all, really all over the world to be more effective as they point teenagers toward Jesus. So whether you've been in youth ministry for 10 days or 10 years, it doesn't matter. We, we all need to be continually refreshing our skills and to be challenged in our calling. So thank you for your commitment to love God and love students is really evidenced by the time that you're taking to, to watch this video. When we look at the ministry of Jesus, we, we see that he had this uh, wide variety of groups that he ministered to. Jesus would speak to crowds, uh, but he would also retreat and hang out with his small group of, you know, the ones we refer to as the disciples. And as you read the Gospels, it seems that he spent the majority of his time with this smaller, more intimate group of guys. And even within the 12, it looks like he had three that were kind of his go-to people, Peter, James, and John. He took them to the mountain and other places. Then if you want to zoom in even closer, it, it says in the book of John that John was, quote, the one Jesus loved the most. Now, I'm not sure if John gave himself that nickname when he wrote the book of John. It's a little suspicious to me, maybe maybe because that's what I would do. You know, Doug, the one that Jesus loved the most. Anyway, uh, regardless, there's plenty of evidence that indicates that Jesus knew how to love people in large groups and in handfuls and one-on-one. -on -one. And from my many years in youth ministry, um, I used to feel guilty for not spending like equal amounts of time with students. And uh, when I would spend time with a few, I would feel guilty that I wasn't being fair to everyone. And then it just dawned on me one day, wait, Jesus didn't do that either. I mean, Jesus preached to the masses, to the many. He hung out with his hand-picked crowd, the disciples, and it appears like he had some go-to guys that seemed to get a little bit more attention than ultimately, again, John, the one he loved the most. So as much as I want to be able to spend time with everyone in the same way in my youth ministry, it's just not possible. I mean, Jesus didn't spend time with everyone, and, you know, he, he was God, so he had that whole divine thing going for him. But what if, play this game with me, what if everyone in your youth group was cared for? Okay, maybe not by you, not by one person, but everyone was cared for by at least someone. Wouldn't that be great? But we can't expect one person do, to do all the caring for all the students. It's not realistic. It's not scalable. And based on the life of Jesus, it's not biblical. So I want to challenge you to what uh, I call this principle a 531 principle. I wrote about this in my book titled, Your First Two Years in Youth Ministry. If you want to dig a little deeper, you can find that principle there. But here's the essence of it. If you're a youth group leader or a small group leader or a Sunday school teacher, I think you begin with this idea that you've got five students that, that you're kind of in charge of shepherding. These are five kids that you're supposed to know, five kids in your small group who you feel responsible for. That means, you know, basic stuff like you know their name, you know some details about their life, you're having spiritual conversations with them, you're kind of trying to disciple them in the ways of Jesus, and your job as a shepherd is to, is to just kind of know them and to make a weekly connect with them in, in some way. You know, if they break a bone, then you're interested in how it happened and you offer to sign their cast. Okay, that's kind of what I'm talking about. You know enough about them to, to know their interests. You follow up with them on their spiritual decisions. Basically, what I like to tell my leaders is you think of yourself as a pastor. You're the pastor of this small group of five. Okay, so that's the five. Now, let's move to the three. These three are within that five, but what would it look like if from the five you were more intentional with three, three young lives. What would happen if you gave just a little bit of extra attention to those three, that you would care for them and connect with them in a more concentrated way? Well, I'll tell you what would happen. Life change would happen, and lots of it. It's not that you're neglecting the other two. It's just that it seems like in a group of five that three might be more interested in spending time with you. They might be more interested in you and in your life. Maybe it's because you share a similar interest or a story, but either way, you just click with them, and the additional time and connection comes more naturally. Okay? So when you're running an errand, you call one of the three to join you, or two of the three, or all three. You know, you take those mundane tasks that you do every week, and you turn those into ministry opportunities. The idea here is that of the five, 
not all five of them are always going to be available or not all five of them are always going to be that interested in the extra time that you might have. That's why you lean into the three. And don't be afraid of really pouring into a few. You know, I know some leaders, they feel guilty about this and they feel like it's favoritism. But to be honest, it isn't favoritism. It's actually stewardship. I mean, favoritism shows partiality for personal gain. But being a good steward of your time means you're investing it wisely. You, you can't go the extra mile with everyone. So you do for the few what you can't do for all. Okay, so you got your group of five that you're, that you're caring for. And then some, maybe three, are going to show more interest in spending time with you. And that's great. So do that and don't feel guilty. Then the final challenge of the five, three, and one challenge is that you find one that, that you really pour into. I mean, this is the person that you kind of duplicate yourself in. I mean, this is the, the one student who's going to point to you as the central influencer in his or her life. And uh, you're going to be the person that was just pivotal in the course of their young life. And I mean, obviously, we hope that all students will remember us you know, fondly and appreciate what we do. But this one, I mean, what I, my experience is that there's one who, who really seems to understand and appreciate your time investment. Now, it isn't just that this one student is the most needy and it's a time dominator type kid. It's more like they want more time or they need more time and they're open to more time and uh, they're available to spend more time together. Now, where this 5-3-1 principle falls apart is when all five lean in and they want as much time from you as you can give them. But, but my experience has been that's pretty much the the exception, not the rule. It always seems like when there's five, you're going to find three who are a little more interested. And of the three, there's one that, that that one becomes really special. I mean, either because they're more needy or there's just this natural affinity and, and attachment. So as a leader, your job is to be talking to God and begging God for discernment to show you which student, you know, of the five, which is the one that is essentially going to call you a mentor. And you don't pick the cute and fun and popular student to become the one. Really, you got to be in prayer over that one. Then when it's clear who the one is, you actually lean in and you give him or her some, some extra time, some extra challenges. You, you maybe ask them to step up and co-lead the group with you or lead the group when you're gone. You, you connect with them more outside of the, the group on a regular basis. Basically, you, you allow God to speak through you to to shape them to become a, a more leadership or ministry type kid. And who knows, maybe that kid is a, is a future youth worker like yourself. But here's what I know, having served teenagers basically my entire adult life, that a loving, Christ-following adult who is pouring his or her life into a teenager's life, that's always a win. That's a, that's a win for discipleship. So when we love the five students, they're all better off. The three who get a little extra time, they're going to greatly benefit from the time and the energy and the investments that you can make. And that one, well, chances are that one is going to be completely different for the rest of their life because of you. I mean, bottom line, as a caring adult, you're making a difference in the life of kids that God is entrusting for you to work with. And that is such a big deal. So I want to thank you for taking some time to care for kids. I want to thank you for uh, the investment that you make as being a part of a youth ministry team. And I just appreciate men and women who make a commitment to follow in the ways of Jesus and to really like teenagers and point them to him. So thanks for doing that.